Hi, Andy. Hi, Victoria. Today, we are going to be speaking with an Irish researcher, Dr. John Cryan, about the microbiome. And this is really a fascinating new field of medicine. Uh, so for listeners who are new, it's about the bacteria, viruses, and fungi that live in and on our bodies with whom we have co-evolved for millions of years. And particularly about how they influence brain function and mental and emotional wellness and how the brain influences them. Andy, you have talked about the mind-body connection for so many years. Mm -hmm. How'd you get it before the microbiome researchers? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, one of the observations <laughs> that I made, which I often uh, tell people about, and this is from my college days, very interesting to go into a student health services the couple of days before exams and see the numbers of people that come in with gut disturbances. Uh, with diarrhea, with nausea, with uh, stomach pain. I mean, obvious, you know, that just hits you in the face. So I, that kind of thing alerted me early on to that connection. Well, let's welcome John. Okay. Dr. John Cryan is a neuroscientist who investigates how the gut microbiome affects the mammalian brain. He is the chair of the Department of Anatomy and Neuroscience at the University College of Cork in Ireland. His research has far-reaching public health implications, ranging from how we view cesarean sections to how the microbiome influences brain development to the impact of probiotics on mood. John's work shows that the term gut feeling might actually make neurobiological sense. Welcome, John. Hi, Victoria. Hi, we're so glad to have you on the show. So I want to jump right in and say that the ability of the gut microbiome to communicate with the brain and maybe modulate behavior is an emerging and exciting concept in medicine. Can you start by just defining what is meant by the gut-brain axis? That, that's a great question. The concept of the gut-brain axis is something that has fascinated physiologists for hundreds of years. Uh, it's really an important aspect of uh, homeostasis in the body, teaching us to feel how we feel. It's a very fundamental part of a process, what we call interoception. Now that might sound like something you know from sort of a sci-fi movie, but it's actually a really important way that the brain is able to know how the body is feeling and it's regulated by key circuits in the brain. Also with the gut-brain axis, we have a second brain, an enteric nervous system, which is an important driver of that. And it's, it's, it's been understudied and, and it's worth pointing out, we have more nerve cells in the second brain than we actually do in the spinal cord. And so, you know, this is really important part. But the mo for me, the most exciting thing is over the last decades, we've, we've got a new player. We've got the microbiome, these trillions of bacteria and, and other microorganisms that inhabit the gut. And these microbiome is seen as a key regulator of what's going on in the gut-brain axis. And so not only do we have a gut-brain axis, we really have a microbiome gut-brain axis. So that's really helpful. I know um, more than 20 years ago, there was a book that came out that I think stirred a lot of interest in people who were interested in this topic called The Second Brain. It was written by Dr. Michael Gershon, and he said that the nerve cells in the gut could act as a brain. But you are now talking about a whole new evolution of research that really looks at bi-directional signaling from the GI tract to the brain and back that helps us with homeostasis and can be messed with. So that's, I think, the, the focus of your research. Can you give us a broad overview of, of what your research is telling us? Sure, sure. I, I mean, the gut brain axis has been best studied in the area of food intake you know, hunger is coming from your gut and, and how you feel and, and, there, and therefore you behave. Is, behavior is changed by these signals, driven often by specific hormones in the gut. And so it's not so, it shouldn't be that weird to the community that we have this other system. And, the, and really what we're interested in doing is understanding how could microbes be important in this? 
So why did we get into this? I guess it's part of it. And, and why do we think it is so important? Well, it's one of the things you start to realize, and, and this is very fundamental in medicine, is that we like to compartmentalize things. And so the body, we compartmentalize. And so if you're interested in brain and behavior like me, uh, then you should just focus really on what's the neck upwards. And, and that's how we train our medical students. But really, w- once you start thinking in a more holistic way and you start looking at things in a more integrated fashion, you start to see that, that they're all parts of the puzzle together. The first thing I want to remind people is that microbes were here first. <laughs> there never has been a time where the brain has existed without microbial signals. We are living in a microbial world. You know, mitochondria, which we study in cells, are just microbes that got lost. Uh, and they provide the engines of, of how cells work in the body. So, you know, these are important things for people that they may, might not realize. Uh, if you look at the genes we have, we are more than 99% microbial. All of that money on the Human Genome Project, and it's less than 1% of our genes. So that's quite startling. The weight of our gut microbes is about the same as our brain. So as a neuroscientist and as a professor of anatomy, this is really humbling to think about, you know, overall. These are some of the things that amaze me about this. But we showed quite a number of years ago, uh, using initially in animal models, we showed that stress in early life, and we're quite interested in early life trauma and the long-term consequences that that has on later susceptibility to psychopathology. And so we develop animal models of this. And we showed in an animal model that when they grew up, they had a whole body syndrome, which is really what we predict from our stress research. We're very interested in, in trying to understand the impact that stress has in on the immune system, on the uh, local, even in the gut, in terms of gut barrier function, and on a variety of biomarkers. Uh, but one of the things we found back then, and it's well over a decade ago now, was we showed that these animals had a change in the diversity of microbes in their gut, that there was a signature of this early life trauma that persisted. We followed this up with studies in prenatal uh, stress models. And this has been now shown even in human uh, small cohorts of of individuals, like a study from the Netherlands, which showed that moms that have high stress during pregnancy, for first time moms, pregnancy can be quite stressful, uh, that there was a signature of this stress in the microbiome in the infants. And so that that was one of our first really interesting points that the microbiome might be important for stress, but it could also be epiphenomenological. It could be due to anything else. So we wanted to really dig into this. Then we're very fortunate here to to have a a facility which basically allows us to ask the question, are microbes important or not? It's basically a facility that allows mice to grow up without any microbes at all. And, you know, when we look at engineering and other aspects of biology, the best way to get evidence that something is important is to take it out and see what happens and how the system works. And so that's something that we worked on and we showed in in them early days that the brains of these animals do not develop appropriately. And this is at the very same time work from Canada, from Jane Foster's group and from the Karolinska Institute, but with Rush LSDS Height also had the same data. And so things started to come together. And this is a great thing in science when you start seeing, you know, we see it now with, with, with vaccines and various things, things start to come together. And that was really remarkable. So, and then we noticed there was a paper from Japan that had been published that was ignored. It was published in a non-glamour journal. It was published in a society journal, Journal of Physiology, uh, some years earlier, which showed that these germ-free mice also have exaggerated stress responses. So not only does stress affect the microbiome, but the microbiome is affecting stress. I'm very impressed when I just scan the news headlines these days. It seems every day there is a report on new correlations between the gut microbiome and general health and mental health. So my impression is that research in this field is just exploding. And it's such a contrast to when I was in medical school when there was no attention paid to the gut microbiome. And to see all these correlations now being uncovered is just fascinating. It really is. It really is. The puzzle for us is to move from correlation to understanding the causal relevance and the relative contribution that they have. But you're so right. In Cork here, we're very lucky because we have a microbiome center that's now 18 years old. It's one of the oldest in in the world, you know, in, in terms of really appreciating the impact the microbiome has on health. But it's not new at all. Eli Mechnikov, 
So yeah. he's one of the heroes in this story, but one of the fathers of modern immunology discovered the process of phagocytosis. So he was, you know, later on in his career, uh, he started coming up with some, what we're seeing as crazy ideas. And one of these ideas was, why did people in parts of rural Bulgaria, and this was, you know, the turn of the 20th century, you know, why do they seem to live longer and healthier? And he wrote about it in a, in a very famous book, and he put it down to what they ate, and mm -hmm. what they ate was a lot of fermented foods mm -hmm. containing lactic acid bacteria. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you can find, I have this wonderful paper uh, from 1904 in the British Journal of Psychiatry about treating melancholia with lactobacilli. Huh. You know, and, and, you know, there's all of this literature and it's an important part of folk medicine and various other parts of traditional medicines, but it really, you know, reinforces uh, certain things that we forget about. And, and we forget about because we don't want to think because, because we compartmentalize things. And so let me, let me ask you a, a, the practical question that always comes up when we talk about, you know, this research is, can you change your gut microbiome? Yeah, or are you saddled with this certain population from birth uh, what do you no, think? About no, no. That? It is a really brilliant question because, and I, I like this is what I like to tell tell people when I, especially when I give patient talks, we've come through a genetic revolution in medicine, you know, and the great, you know, and it's it's proved provided a lot, but you know, from the Human Genome Project upwards, there isn't an awful lot we can do except blame our parents and our grandparents about our genes. <laughs> but with your microbiome, with your microbiome, you have a real opportunity to actually take agency over your own health and modify it. And we're only understanding what are the constraints on that. And so some of the best studies are people who move from certain cultures to others, or people who go from extreme meat-based diets to plant-based diets or whatever else. And you can see these changes in the, in the microbiome. But you are right, Andrew, in, in terms of that at the beginning, you know, there, there is a kind of a priming and a setting up. And there is some genetic influence on what gives you your microbiome as well. But I think there is huge opportunities here. But we need a lot more data. We need a lot more evidence uh, to, to really get at, you know, why, why does my microbiome respond to this diet and yours might not? And it, does, it is the epitome, really, of personalized medicine. It really is. It really is. So how do you, you know, uh, commercialize it and make it into other things is, is, is a hurdle for people. But for people interested in integrative approaches, it really is is part of that. We're not there yet. You can go to a uh, and get your blood pressure uh, measured, and you know exactly whether you're where you are. You can get your cholesterol measured, and you know where you are. You can get your glucose measured. You can go get your microbiome measured, and it doesn't tell you. You know, it will just you. The look of despair on the traditional physicians would be if you go in with your microbiome. <laughs> because, you know, we don't know what to do fully with the information yet. We don't. Okay, know but what Normal. While we don't know fully, and we may not know exactly what is normal, that's exactly what our patients ask us all the time. So, Andy, I'm wondering if you would be willing, um, like you often are, to step out into what's <laughs> not fully known and give recommendations that people ask, what can we do? What do we know at this moment in time that a person can do to have a really healthy gut? Well, I mean, that what I tell people is, first of all, be very cautious about using antibiotics unless they're absolutely necessary. Uh, second, I think a plant-based diet is uh, favors the diversity and uh, microbial populations that you want. Uh, I think it is useful to eat fermented foods, probably more important than taking probiotic supplements. And it's so easy to make fermented foods at home. I do that and I tell other people to do that. And there's a whole variety of them. So it's not just, uh, you know, it's not just pickles and sauerkraut, it's fermented dairy products, fermented soy foods and so forth. I think it is useful to eat a variety of prebiotic foods, uh, foods that nourish the uh, healthy organisms in the microbiome and, and to really reduce consumption of refined processed and manufactured foods. So th that's the basic advice that I would give. So I want to just add to that amazing list that 
get your mother to have you buy vaginal delivery yes. instead of C-section. <laughs> <Right. laughs> this is advice we should give to all our patients in an era where some C-sections are elective and where some might be avoided with different planning and different conversations. Uh, C-section can be life-saving. So of course, uh, we don't want to eliminate all C-section, but sometimes it can be avoided. Uh, have your mother breastfeed you because that's going to nourish the developing microbiome. And then avoid artificial sweeteners. Avoid diet sodas and other things that are um, sweetened with artificial sweeteners because there are human studies to show that that can alter the microbiome in some dangerous ways. John, what would you add? Yeah, we coined this phrase psychobiotic in, in Cork here as a way of, and, and to have a psychobiotic lifestyle, that's exactly what we feel is really relevant. Sleep and the microbiome are very closely intertwined. We're very, we're very excited about circadian rhythms and, and the microbiome and we have ongoing projects there. If you, and so once you get your sleep disturbed, it will affect. So, so you know, uh, when I was traveling all the time, my jet lag wasn't good for my microbiome and it was obvious. The other thing is it's known also having a pet, uh, especially a dog. Uh, having a dog is really good for your microbiome. And and there's really great studies now on pet ownership in early life and allergy and asthma. John, how about uh, kissing your dog? Or, or <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not I can't avoid that sometimes. I have one dog that really likes to kiss me. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> but but but, they, but everything else is is, is 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 what you captured there. Um and, and the, the early life uh, priming is really important, but but as an adult, we can still do a lot. We've just completed a short study here in, in Cork where we get people to change their diet for one month. And these were stress-sensitive people with relatively bad diets. And uh, we upped the fiber, doubled their fiber intake, and really upped the fermented foods and gave a Mediterranean-style based diet too. And, you know, their stress levels, these were students coming through exams, you know, their stress levels were much great, greatly reduced. They had less signs of, 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 of depression. And so we think, you know, targeting Targeting the microbiome is going to be a really important way uh, of well-being. But what we don't know is what works for you may not work for the next person. So you, you kind of need to, to try it. I would encourage people also to, to be uh, somewhat skeptical of anything you see out there that's, that's being sold uh, mm -hmm. from a, a commercial point of view without evidence, because there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of snake oil out there and regulation isn't very good. So I would be, you know, exactly what Andy talked about there in terms of the low cost fermented foods are, are really good, but there are lots of other products that are, may not be as well uh, studied. You know, John, one other uh, uh, Possibility is, I, I'm, I'm sure you are a friend of the hygiene hypothesis. Yeah. You know, I think uh, avoiding germicidal products in the home and not being too concerned about, you know, ingesting some dirt here and there. Uh, well, it, it, it's harder in the COVID world. It, yeah, of course. It's, of course. it's really harder. And uh, but I'm, I'm an avid gardener, and I think having your hands in soil and getting little bits of that stuff in your mouth and, you know, not being so fastidious about washing uh, vegetables that you pull from your own garden, that probably also contributes to a healthy microbiome. Absolutely, absolutely. Body of Wonder is produced by the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. Internationally recognized for innovative health and wellness programs, evidence-based research, and clinical standards. The center offers listeners a wide range of free resources to live and maintain a healthy lifestyle, including online learning, meditations, and short videos. To find out more, go to azcim.org slash podcast. That's azcim.org slash podcast. John, where is the science on fecal transplant yeah. uh, for mental health? I, I have heard so many people intrigued with, could their depression go away if only they could get a transplant? That's not legal in the U.S., where is it in the UK and when when might it show up? Yeah, so in here in Ireland it's not either. We're very cautious as well. It's an intriguing, it's an intriguing possibility because you know it, it's basically I, I like to give the analogy, you know, if your microbiome is like a lawn, uh, sometimes your lawn it just needs extra fertilizer. So that's like giving uh, prebiotics and, and stimulating. Sometimes you have to plant new seeds. So that's giving probiotics. But sometimes, sometimes you just have to take up the lawn in extreme situations and plant a new lawn. 
And that's what a fecal transplant is about. So the, so the data is, is really good in infections. Um, but outside of that, it, it, it's more equivocal in areas like inflammatory bowel disease. There was an interesting small study out of St. Louis where they were looking at people, severe alcoholics, and showing that FMTs were beneficial. There's been one small study in autism uh, on compassionate grounds, which, which shows potential. It's small. Uh, it's only got uh, 20 patients and, or less and has no real control group. So we need caution, but it's very promising. Um, There are studies, and I'm involved in collaborating on studies in Australia, where we're trying to set up protocols for doing this in depression. And then Valerie Taylor's group now in Calgary, in in Canada, has an ongoing uh, study. So we'll see how, how it becomes mainstream. There's safety concerns. There's regulatory concerns. You know, how do you call this a medicine or how do you, what do you do with it? So I, my advice to people who are suffering with depression would be to try radical changing their diet towards this kind of psychobiotic diet uh, at first. The other factor we didn't mention in the previous conversation was about exercise. And the role is now becoming quite clear that exercise, especially aerobic exercise, has real beneficial effects on the on the microbiome. And we have ongoing studies. They're early, but we're trying to see is, is the beneficial effects of exercise and depression, could it be due to shifts in the microbiome? And that's something uh, as well. So I think caution in the fecal transplant world, and we'll we'll see whether the data you know uh, comes together. But there was a nice study just published in we talked about C sections where they did a fecal transplant in in C section. So uh, it was small, it was N of seven, but it was in in the biggest journal cell. So uh, you know the people are doing more and more. We're going to see this more and more. And anything that disrupts medicine is good in terms of, you know, it, it takes us out of our comfort zone and challenges our whole idea of how we can target specific areas. John, you've used the term psychobiotic a couple of times now. Can you define it for our listeners and, and explain what a psychobiotic diet is? Yeah. So so we originally, um, my colleague, Ted Dynan, who's the head of psychiatry, just retired, and I, you know, we coined this a few years ago, and we originally had a very narrow definition, which was just about bacteria that when taken in adequate amounts could confer a health benefit. But more recently, we've actually expanded it to being any way of targeting the microbiome that will be uh, good for preventing mental illness and supporting people who have mental health issues. So anything that affects the brain. And so we really wanted you know, to, to, to put this in the context of nutrition, because nutrition is really one of the best ways that we can get at the microbiome. And, and we know from studies that, you know, the best way to try and recover some of the lack of diversity, uh, this is studies, for example, here in Cork have been done in elderly individuals. And it showed that those that had a Mediterranean style diet, that they had a much increased diversity in their microbiome and better health outcomes. We're quite passionate about it because also we, we realized we both worked in a medical school and the curriculum is so full, they get so little nutritional you know, study. Our dentists get more than our physicians. So we really wanted to push this concept that, that, that by targeting the microbiome gut-brain axis, uh, we could actually you know, uh, have beneficial effects. We need to create more and more evidence, but, but we're excited about it. And we have some really good, really strong hints that it's working a, as an approach. And what we're trying to do then is triangulate the relation. We know diets, certain diets are good for the brain, but we think that, and certain diets are good for the microbiome. So the question is, is the healthy effects of diet on the brain mediated by what they're doing on the microbiome? And we're trying to deconvolute this and try and understand this. And it's, it's really, you know, understanding that the microbiome is really a factory. It's really like, a, you know, one of these rust belt factories that is taking in raw material from the diet and acting on that raw material and producing chemicals that our body wouldn't have without it. And that's really, once you start thinking of that, that you have this factory within you, that, and you can tailor what's coming in by tailoring your diet, then, you know, and so in a psychobiotic diet, what we're trying to do is increase the amount of fermented foods, increase the amount of fibers. Fiber is king in this regard, if you get to a tolerability level. Like a lot of fibers cannot be broken down by the body, but they're broken down by the microbes. So we have co-evolved with these microbes to allow them. We've kind of, you know, 
uh, privatize some of the work to the microbes to take <laughs> from the diet. And, uh, and, and this is really, really interesting. And, you know, one of the most interesting examples of this, and you mentioned breastfeeding earlier, um, is that, and this was really surprising to me when, 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 when I was told this, is that if you look at the sugars in breast milk, in human breast milk, these human milk oligosaccharides, they're about 20 times more complex than that what you guess in cow's milk. Now, nature doesn't make things complex for you know, reasons just to be difficult. And it's, these sugars cannot be broken down by the infant, but they're broken down by the microbes. And what are they broken down into? Broken down into chemicals like sialic acid, which is really important for brain development. And so we're beginning to see that, you know, these sugars have evolved this complexity to be able to support the evolution of the, the brain and the development of the brain to be optimal. And so some of the beneficial effects that are well reported in breastfeeding uh, in terms of cognitive development may be due to some of the effects of the microbiome. The opposite is also work from Jeff Gordon's group in St. Louis and others is showing that in severe malnutrition, especially in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, where you have stunted growth and brain development issues, that this is due to a lack of these microbes that can actually work on the sugar and of, of the sugars. And so you, you kind of need to have a two-pronged approach, replace the microbes and replace the raw materials that are coming in. You have also been researching the vagus nerve. Oh yeah. The vagus nerve is super interesting in that it is the most important nerve, I believe, in calming the nervous system. In integrative medicine, we teach people a lot of different strategies ranging from breathing exercises to yoga practice, to meditation, to tone the nervous system, specifically the quieting side that is uh, led by the vagus nerve. So how are you thinking about the vagus nerve? Does the vagus nerve change the microbiome? Does the microbiome change the vagus nerve signals? What has your research shown you? So our research showed, and this goes back to a paper we published in 2011, where we showed, again, it was an animal study initially, where we showed that uh, a specific strain of lactobacillus, when we, when we gave it to, 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 to uh, a mouse model, it had uh, effects on the neurotransmitters in the brain, affected stress-related behaviors, fear learning, a variety of different things. And all of these effects were gone when we cut the vagus nerve. So this is, uh, as I like to remind people. What this, happened uh, to those people? What happened instead? <laughs> they, 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 just, they, behaved, they, they, they behaved just like as if they were given a placebo. So there was no negative effects. Wow. There was no negative effect, really. They didn't respond to this lactobacillus. So this tells us that what happens in Vegas doesn't just stay in Vegas, but will actually affect our emotions. <laughs> and, and, and that's something that, uh, you know, uh, I finally published that in the title of a, a, an article last year, uh, What Happens in Vegas. You know, I think it's really important. What we're doing now is a uh, number of the postdocs in my lab are trying to figure this out. How do you get to Vegas from the microbes? Because there's still a fair bit of, room uh, to, to go. And then when you get from the vagus into their brainstem, uh, where does it go? Which circuits in the brain become activated? And how do you basically hijack them? And it's such an exciting area right now. And it's really important. And, uh, and Vegas is definitely one of the main communication pathways. And of course, this is the one that, that is being used during meditation and mindfulness and various other things as well. And it's bi-directional. And I think that's the other important part of it. But, but as I, you know, I neglect to mention it a lot, a lot of times, the vagus doesn't innervate the lower colon. So the, it's not the whole story. So a lot of the fermentation goes on in the lower colon. So, so, so there, are other, there are other pathways at play. And, and we're very interested in these metabolites right now and these, what, what these microbes make, uh, because I think there's going to be a lot of interesting things emerging from that. Have you studied the effects of these mindfulness practices, uh, meditation, uh, yoga, breathing, other things? So, so we have one ongoing study, that we, which is, it, it's completed now, and we're analyzing the microbiome in it, in where we looked at mindfulness training. There is the one thing that we're that gels us all, all our studies together, and so uh, this was uh, in caregivers of people who have Alzheimer's disease. We put them through a mindfulness intervention, and we're now looking at their microbiome. And so we'll be interested to see. I mean, these these are tough studies to do because these people have a lot going on anyway, and so adding to their burden by 
getting them to you know take biological samples and things can be tricky so so uh, but we have the we we have, we have the data now and we're beginning we're mining it now to see what exactly is going on i'd love to see a lot more work in this field uh, i guess that's one of my take home messages is that we need to I, i'm always encouraged when when more and more people get interested in this field uh, overall because the, the more data we have the more evidence we can see about you know what will work for what person in what situation. So Andy, when you look into the future of medical practice, where do you see the individualized care of the gut going? I think it's going to be huge, uh, especially really knowing what practical advice we can give people for how to get and maintain a healthy gut microbiome, uh, how to use interventions directed at the gut to modify brain function and emotional and, and mental wellness, how to use your mind in ways to harmonize gut function and treat many of the common uh, functional ailments of the gut. I, I just think we're at the beginning of this new kind of medicine. It's very exciting. Thanks, Andy. John, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree. It is opening the door. And there was a paper just published about all the confounds in microbiome science. And some people see this as a negative, but it's actually a real positive because we're really being able to see how do we design these studies better? How do we, how, what type of sample size we need and really to build up evidence. And I'm always about the evidence. So mm -hmm. where is, you know, where is the evidence? But there is a paradigm shift in thinking about the brain and the mind and uh, how we behave in a different way. One of the areas that, you know, where I'm really wondering about in this COVID world, you know, with lockdowns and increased hygiene, how much we're interfering with our everyday microbiomes and what are the long-term consequences of that? We've been very interested in social. When there's something about the social brain and the microbiome and how they interact with each other. And that's something that we've been very uh, interested in as well. Well, thank you, John, so very much for taking this time to speak with us uh, on our Body of Wonder podcast. We really appreciate it. It's yeah, really pleasure. good conversation. Really my pleasure. Andy, great to meet you. Nice to meet you. And thank you, uh, Victoria, for being such a great uh, host. Well, we appreciate having you on the show. Thank you so much. Listeners, this is Dr. Victoria Mazes. We would love for you to send us your questions for Andy, myself, or for our guests. You can call us and leave a voicemail by dialing 520-621-3950. Again, 520-621-3950. Or you can submit a question by going to our website, azcim.org slash podcast. Again, azcim.org slash podcast. We will review your questions and try to answer as many as possible on our programs. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Body of Wonder brought to you by the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. If you like the show, please rate us five stars, follow the show, and leave a review. To learn more about Integrative Healing and the Center, go to azcim.org slash podcast. That's azcim.org slash podcast.